story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. Now, though James wrote this letter to dispersed Jews, it's very relevant for us because we are dispersed Christians. And uh, some Christians are so... Oh, let me go back to the earlier chart just for a moment. Some Christians are so wrapped up in Christian church and Christian meetings that they're more like the Jews in Jerusalem. Their problem is pride and their problem is they're more isolated from the world out there and you can very quickly get like that. But most Christians are like the Jews in the dispersion. They're working in the everyday world. You're working in the television world, Gerald, and you're right in there with all kinds of other standards and morals around you. And many of you are in this, in the factory, in the shop, wherever you work. You're out there in the world. You're dispersed. You feel you're away from God's people. And your temptation is much more likely to be the second one, uh, especially that you get caught up in the money world and the greed of our society, the acquisitive society and the materialism of it. And you get assimilated so that people can't see that you're God's people. You're just like them, except that you go to church on Sunday. Well now, that's why James is such a relevant letter to us, because we are now God's dispersed people, certainly from Monday to Saturday, whereas on Sunday we're more like the, the ghetto and we come into a Christian environment. So let's look at what uh, James talks about. One of the themes that comes in frequently in the letter is business. And of course, a lot of the dispersed Jews were in business, as they often are. You see, they've been hounded around from one country to another, so they have to have a trade or profession that is easily portable. That's why they've been tailors. You only need to take a needle and thread with you. They've been jewelers because you can pack up your goods in a small suitcase. They've been moneylenders because through medieval Europe, Jews were not allowed to or Christians were not allowed to be moneylenders, so the Jews did it all. It's how they became the bankers and the Rothschilds. And so Jews have just had to be very good at business. They've learned to live by their wits. They are very shrewd judges of customers, and they are good at business, no question about it. But that has its own snags. Jesus, the Jewish Jesus, said you cannot worship God and mammon. You can't devote yourself to God and money-making at the same time. Now the Pharisees laughed when Jesus said that because they were both rich and religious. But Jesus said, it's impossible, and they laughed at him and said, he's a penniless beggar anyway. He doesn't know how to make money, so he's just against the rich. But Jesus knew, he constantly warned us that it's hard for rich people to get into the kingdom. And by New Testament standards, almost every one of us in this room is rich. And 99% of the people in this country are rich by New Testament standards, and that's why it's so hard to get them into the kingdom. But there are dangers of riches. Money itself can do a lot of good. It's neutral. But the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, said Paul. And in this uh, little letter, wealth has corrupted some of his readers. Here are some of the things that they are now doing. They are exploiting their employees holding their wages back to help the cash flow of the business. They're doing that. They're indulging themselves and spending money on needless luxuries. They are flattering rich people who come into their assemblies, telling the poor people they can sit at the back, but showing rich people who come to the front seats. Now that's a very subtle thing, but I know churches and fellowships where a few rich people in the fellowship are controlling it. Because people are giving a wrong authority to them because they finance so much. And that's a very dangerous position to get into. But some of these fellowships were giving too much attention to the wealthy members who are no more important than anybody else. 
they were insulting poor people and despising them. The trouble is when you make money, you regard yourself as successful and then you regard others as failures who haven't made it and you look down on them and snobbery goes with wealth and that was happening here. And above all, it was giving them a false security and that's the worst thing about money, it gives you a false security. Remember the rich fool? I will pull down my barns and build greater. I and he said to himself, I'm going to take it easy now, I'm going to take my redundancy money, retire early and have a good time. Jesus said, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. See, money deceives. The deceitfulness of riches, Jesus called it. And this was getting into the Jewish believers in the dispersion because so many of them were in business. And of course, it, it wreaks havoc with godliness. Because when you've got plenty of money, you make plans without reference to God. And you say, right, I'm going to go to such and such a city and I'm going to open a new branch there. And James says you should always add God willing. My father always used to put DV in his letters. It's a habit that's died right out. It's, it's short for a Latin phrase, Deo Valenti, which means God willing. And he would often write in a letter, uh, look forward to seeing you, DV. Yeah, and James says, when you become wealthy, you leave out the DV and you decide where you're going to have your holidays and you decide where you're going to live and you decide which house to buy instead of DV, Deo Valenti, God willing. And you see, we can say, right, we're going to plan another series here and we're going to do unlocking the Old Testament. But we should say, we're going to plan another series of videoing DV. DV, because uh, Jim could be in heaven before me even. <laughs> See, any of us could be in heaven by next year this time. God willing, God willing. So there's a whole lot about this. The neglect of God and the neglect of the poor tends to accompany money making. And also he lists the sins of the rich here. I just run through them, envy. Funnily enough, the more you have, the more you want. And the more you envy those who've got more. Isn't it incre crazy? I, I often sort of watch these big men. Robert Maxwell was one, he was Jewish. But you know, it seemed as if he couldn't be content with what he had. He had to take more. Far more than he would ever need to cover himself and his uh, family's needs. He had to have more and more and more. And Australia's produced quite a few of those. Bond. You know? And they overreach themselves because of the greed and the envy of others who are bigger than they are. It's a kind of jungle up there. Selfish ambition, pride, boasting and bragging, presumption, impatience, anger, covetousness, <coughs> arguments, quarrels, fights, and litigation. Litigation. Anybody criticized Robert Maxwell found them in court, themselves in court and lawyers against them. Litigation is one of the pastimes of the rich. This is very relevant stuff, isn't it? I mean, you could really take the letter of James into the city of London and preach on it. I was once asked to go and speak to all the members of the Stock Exchange and they asked me for a title before I went and I said, um, give them this title, you can't take it with you and if you would it would burn. <laughs> and um, they, they absolutely refused to publicize the title, but there we are. So I changed it, How to Invest Beyond the Grave. And uh, they, they were quite interested. You can take your money with you. You can lay up treasure for yourself in heaven. And Jesus told us how to. Most people are just putting it into the pension before they die, not realizing that two minutes after they die, they'll be bankrupt because they've sent nothing on ahead. So James is so so relevant to this, but wealth produces godlessness. That's what he's saying. If you're not careful, money comes in and God goes out. And James says, don't let that happen, you Jewish believers in the dispersion. Now another weakness for expatriates is gossip. If ever you've been in an expatriate community overseas, you know, where you've got a bunch, bunch of Scots or a bunch of English, in the Persian Gulf or somewhere. You know what happens, they, they have a club 
and all the gossip that goes on in that club. People far from home find in gossip their little community. And James understands this only too well. And he has an awful lot to say about the tongue and about words. He said, you use the same tongue to bless people and curse them. He says, it's like bitter and sweet water coming out of the same fountain. And then he says this, you know, I once heard of a vicar who said in the pulpit, I'm now going to show you that part of my body that causes me most temptation. <laughs> well, he's certainly got attention. That's, <laughs> that's uh, very good rhetoric. And then he went, <laughs> you see? And the point came across. <laughs> they never forgot the sermon. But James says, that little thing, that's the hardest part of your body to control. And he said, if you can control that, you're a perfect man. So here's a ready reckoner for how holy you are. Just consider your speech. That's all, because it's out of the abundance of the heart that your mouth speaks. That's why Jesus said, we shall be judged on the day of judgment for every careless word. Because it's the careless words when you're tired that really reveal your real heart. Not your careful speech when you're thinking about what to say. Do you know, some people are so scared of things like the gift of tongues because they're so used to controlling everything they say. They're scared stiff of saying something that they haven't carefully thought through. But you know, it's the careless words, the words when you're tired or angry that really reveal what your heart is. And this little thing, it has been set on fire by hell, said James. And it's like a little ship's rudder but it can turn the whole ship. It's like a forest fire that started with one match. You know, there was a, a lady in France went to her priest to confession Saturday night, and she said, Father, I've realized I'm a gossip. Please, can I be forgiven? And the priest said, not until you've done penance. She said, I'll do anything. What do I have to do? He said, go and pluck the feathers off two chickens and bring them here in a bag. So she brought a bag full of feathers to the church. And the priest said, good, that's half the penance, now there's another half. Go and throw them to the four winds. Go down the village street and just throw them up in the air. So she went, she came back, she said, now can I be forgiven? No, he said, there's just one more thing, go and pick them all up again. <laughs> she said, but I can't. No, he said, and you can't go and pick up all the gossip you've done in this village. You've been scattering gossip all over this village and you'll never be able to catch up with it. Well, it's a... Good story. <laughs> I read it. <laughs> you know, was that true or were you just preaching? I don't know, but it's a good story. Gossip, the tongue, it can be so damaging. And you are really entirely sanctified when you always say the right thing, and when you keep silent when you should be, and when you speak up when you should. Because just keeping your mouth shut all the time isn't having mastered your speech. There are times when we ought to speak out and don't. There are times when we ought to shut up and speak out. So grumbling, cursing, lying, swearing are all mentioned in this little letter. Because you see, expatriates far from home very easily get into sins of the tongue. Now, another one. World opens up this letter quite a bit. That's another theme that keeps cropping up. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Let's be in no doubt a bit about this. You can't be popular with the world and with God. Jesus wasn't, and if he couldn't manage it, you won't. In fact, the more godly you are, the less popular you're likely to be. Paul actually said to Timothy, whoever would live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. They may respect you, but they'll try and knock it out of you. You'll be laughed at. But it's so easy to flirt with the world. And James says, pure religion and undefiled before God is two things, to keep yourself unspotted or untainted from the world and to visit widows and orphans in their distress. How practical that is, to help those most in need, to be alongside people, but not to be infected, not to be tainted. 
We've got to be in the world but not of it. Jesus didn't want us to go into monasteries and convents. He didn't want us to get out of the world. But you know, it's amazing how many Christians want to do that. A girl came to me once, she said, isn't it wonderful, David? She said, I was the only Christian where I worked, but she said, I saw an advertisement in a Christian magazine and it's a Christian firm and they want a secretary and everybody in the firm's a Christian. And she said, I'm going to be working just with Christians. And then she saw my face. She said, what's the matter? Well, I said, first, you won't find working with Christians the promised land. <laughs> you will very quickly find, you know, to dwell above with saints I love, that'll be glory. <laughs> to dwell below with saints I know, that's another story. <laughs> and I said, first, you won't find that it's the promised land. But I said, secondly, you just said you were the only Christian where you worked. The only link they had with Jesus. And now you've broken it. Why didn't you stay there and pray that God would send you a Christian friend? See, uh, My friend Peter Betson in Australia, I'm sure you've heard me mention him more than once, and you've met him, uh, the honest used car dealer, everybody calls him. Now, he has 40 staff who are out on the roads buying cars for him to sell. And he sells to the trade, and he sells a car every 50 seconds on Tuesdays and Thursdays. He's quite a guy, or he, he did, he's now out of that business, but um, anyway, what was I going to tell you about him? <laughs> yes, as soon as any member of his staff becomes a Christian, he sacks them. <laughs> and he finds them a job somewhere else. On the principle, as he says, how can I be a, a witness at work if I'm surrounded by Christians? Boy, there's a bit of thinking for you. I find Christians want to get into Christian firms or buy a farm in the country and go and milk cows and sing choruses till the bus comes by. <laughs> you know? Listen, Jesus said, Father, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you'll keep them in the world. See? And James is saying this. This is a very delicate balance. We've got to be right there in the world, but untainted. The infection should go the other way and not this way. Very practical. Now he says, you need to know the difference between being tested and being tempted. God will never tempt you, but he will test you. And you only test people hoping that they will pass the test, but you tempt them hoping they will fail. That's the big difference. Now God will test you. So count it all joy when you're tested, when things get tough. God is moving you up a class, moving you up a grade. You know, when General Booth's wife suffered greatly towards the end, or was it Hudson Taylor's wife? Hudson Taylor's wife towards the end went blind and was uh, suffering quite a lot. And somebody said, uh, why should God do this to you when you've served him so faithfully? Oh, she said, he's putting the finishing touches to my character. Count it all joy when you're tested. If life's easy for you, don't rejoice. But when you're tested, moved up a grade, God's setting you an examination, and he wants you to pass, and he will test you to pass you, to move you up. Life is likely to get harder. I find, for example, that guidance gets harder. Do you? The Lord took mercy on us early and gave us such clear guidance we had no doubt, and then he puts you in a situation where you've really got to begin to work things out for yourself a bit. He doesn't spoon feed you about guidance as you mature. Do you find that? Or maybe you're one of those who gets got a hotline to heaven and gets telegrams for everything you want to know. Um, I find it does get more difficult. God get, puts you in more responsibility and trusts you to make judgments instead of just giving you a text. So uh, he's testing you. But it's the devil who tempts you, and he wants you to fail. And he can only tempt you if there's something in you already that he can get hold of. If there's some desire in you that takes the bait. So there's a lot here about testing and tempting. In the world you will be tested by God, but I'm afraid you'll be tempted by the devil as well. But here's a promise from somewhere else. God has promised that you will never ever be tempted more than you can cope with which means, of course, that the devil is totally under God's control. 
Isn't that exciting? The devil can't touch you unless he gets permission from God first. Read the book of Job. And he can't tempt you. And so God has promised you so that you will never, ever be able to say as a Christian, I couldn't help it. But I hear Christians saying that and queuing up for deliverance rather than facing the facts that God has told them, has given them the grace to say no. And that temptation is not too much for them. But the devil can only tempt us when we want something we shouldn't have. And he can latch on to that. And he hooks you. So in the world we face testing and temptation. One comes from God in the hope that you'll pass the test. The other comes from the devil in the hope that you'll fail. And we need the wisdom to discern which is which. A man once came to me on a Tuesday evening in our fellowship down at Guildford and he said, Oh, he said, David, Satan's been having a go at me all day. I said, tell me how. Well, he said, I got up late and he said, I rushed my breakfast, ran for the train at Guildford Station and saw it just pulling out as I got there. He said, I had to catch the next train. I missed a most urgent appointment. He said, from then on, just everything's gone wrong. The devil's really had a go at me. I said, no, he hasn't. I said, why did you get up late? He said, forgot to set the alarm last night. <laughs> See? We should not blame the devil, because often the flesh that's the problem, you see. I don't think the devil had any hand in that whatsoever. But it's so nice, you know, for Christians to make the devil the scapegoat. When the devil really gets at you, but my, it's more serious than that. But uh, we shall be tempted, but never more than we can cope with. That's a promise. Now, wisdom. That's really what it's all about. And there are two sorts of wisdom. And just as there are two sorts of uh, trial, the testing and temptation, there are two sorts of wisdom in the world. Wisdom from above and wisdom from below. Both are wise. The wisdom from below comes from human experience. It comes from uh, having known about a thing for a long time, of having tried things out. You build up human experience, human wisdom, through experience. In, and we call it the school of experience, whose colors are black and blue. And we learn wisdom from our experience. But there's another way to get wisdom. And it doesn't take so long. And it's to ask for it. To ask for it. And you get it. And James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, don't say, oh, well, it's because I'm just a young Christian or I'm not very experienced. Don't talk like that. You can get wisdom from above right away by asking for it without double-mindedness, without, without doubting. Ask for wisdom in that situation. I can give you some lovely down-to-earth examples of this. I once faced a really difficult situation. Three girls and three young men arrived in my office and they said, we want you to marry us. And I said, what, all of you? Yes. And it turned out these three girls had been at college together and they, they were like that, you know? Well, like that. And they'd run the Christian unit college for years together. And now the time had come to leave. They'd all fallen in love and got engaged, but they didn't want to say goodbye to each other. So they'd gone house hunting and they said, we found a lovely big house that can hold all of us and we want a wedding three of us and three of us all together and we're going to live together as one happy family. And I looked at these three young men <laughs> and they all looked a bit sheepish and they'd all been trapped into this troika, you know? And I, I just had to say, Lord, I need wisdom because I knew they'd already been to the house agent for the house and I knew if I refused to take the wedding, they'd just go to another pastor and fix it up there. I said, Lord, I need wisdom. You gave it to Solomon. Give it to me, please. And he did. He said, right, I'll take, I said, All right, I'll take the wedding. But I said, each of you will have to say the promises five times to all the other five involved. So you must say, for better, for worse, for better, for worse, for better, for worse, you see, to all five. I said, if you're all going to live together, you've got to be faithful. So I'll take the wedding, but you each make all the promises five times to all the other five people. See, there's a dead silence. <laughs> They said, oh, they said, uh, could we have a little time to think about it? I said, of course, take all the time you wish, you see. <laughs> and they left me. 
and they walked past the, the house where we lived next door, and my wife saw them out of the kitchen window. She came straight into me, she said, what have you been telling those young people? <laughs> she said, I've never seen such unhappy looking young people, what have you done to them? And I told her, and we just collapsed in laughter. And the next day they all came back, all very sheepish now, and they said, uh, we're not so sure about it now. I said, uh, what would you advise us? I said, well, to tell you the truth, I suggest you have three separate marriages and in 12 months' time, you go and buy that house and move in together. <laughs> well, they did and they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you see? But you see, it was the, just that kind of situation. Why don't we ask for wisdom more often? It's available for us. And, and James says it's, it's a lovely wisdom because it's pure and it's peaceable solves the problem. Now listen, all divine wisdom is available to you at any moment when you're in a difficulty, in a jam. All you've got to do is say, Lord, I need wisdom. And Solomon got it with those two women arguing about one baby. Got it straight away. Do you know what God said to Solomon? He said, now you're king, I'll give you anything you ask for, fame, wealth, anything you want, just ask for it. And Solomon said, wisdom. God said, because you asked for wisdom, I'll see you get everything else. So pleased God to have someone asking for wisdom. Now we're in many difficult situations in the world. You will be in an impossible situation. You think, there's just no way out of this. There's just no solution to it. And that's the very moment when James says, just ask for wisdom. And you'll astonish yourself. You really will. So, what a lovely uh, w bit of wisdom this whole letter is. But now we come to the problem. There is one big problem in James, and it's in chapter 2. And uh, let's take first the general problem. The general problem is that it doesn't sound to be a very Christian letter. There's not much about Christ in it. There's not much gospel in it. There's much more emphasis on man's activity than God's, much more emphasis on deeds rather than doctrine, almost on law rather than gospel, on works rather than faith. There's no mention of Jesus' death or resurrection or ascension. There's no mention of the Holy Spirit's work in us. It's all about doing good deeds. Well, surely this is not Christianity. This is the very concept of Christianity we want to get rid of. There's nothing about forgiveness. I suppose one could say there's everything about holiness. But uh, it seems to be weighted in that way. So Martin Luther was disgusted with this letter. He actually said it contains nothing evangelical. He said it doesn't show Christ to you. And in fact it only mentions him twice actually in the whole letter. So there's, in fact, there's very little in this whole letter that an Orthodox Jew couldn't accept. Just cut out the two mentions of Christ and one or two other things and an Orthodox Jew would agree with everything. So, let's come to the specific problem. That's the general problem and it focuses in that chapter 2 where James says, you see then that a man is justified by his works and not by faith alone. Now that's when the explosion occurs. And so this letter has had considerable difficulty getting into the New Testament. And there are those who would rather cut it out. I've mentioned Martin Luther, but he went much further. He said, this is a right straw epistle. So there's no corn in it, it's just straw. Uh, which was about as insulting a remark as he could make. He said, I do not believe it is apostolic. It would be better not to have it in the New Testament. And when he translated the Bible, he put James in an appendix at the end. He didn't quite have the courage to cut it right out, but he shifted it out of the main text and put it as an appendix. He says it undermines the fundamental gospel truth of justification by faith alone. Well, I think it's very unfortunate that Martin Luther missed the point. 
He said it contradicts Paul and all the other scriptures and I refuse to put this book in the canon of scripture or the rule of scripture. Well, Martin Luther was no more infallible than the Pope he opposed. And we mustn't treat any Bible teacher as infallible. So how do we deal with the problem? James died in the year 62 and therefore couldn't have read Paul's letters on the subject. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is, I want to point out that whereas Paul was writing for Gentiles, James was writing for Jewish believers. Paul was defending Gentiles from Jewish legalism, whereas James was defending Jews from Gentile license. Now can I repeat that again? Have you noticed how often legalism, license and liberty keep coming through as themes? Because this is the fundamental problem for Christians, how to keep out of legalism and license. And Paul was trying to keep the Gentiles out of Jewish legalism, which was salvation by works. Whereas James has quite a different task to keep Jewish believers out of Gentile license. The, do you? follow that difference. And sometimes preachers do appear to contradict themselves because they're dealing with different problems. And some people need to be told it's by faith alone and some others need to be told about works to get the balance right. And there is a balance. So the general qu question is faith versus works. And I believe James needs the rest of the New Testament and the rest of the New Testament needs James. I believe God is giving us two different angles on this crucial issue so that we get it in balance and get the whole truth. You see, legalism says we are saved by works. License says we are saved without works. But liberty says we are saved for works. Can I repeat that? Legalism says we're saved by our good deeds. License says we're saved without good deeds. But liberty says we're saved for good deeds. And even Paul says this in Ephesians 2. He says that God has prepared good works for us before we're saved so that we can walk in them after we're saved. So we're not saved by good deeds, but we are saved for good deeds. Now James is saying the second, Paul is saying the first, and they're both true. But we need to look very carefully at James chapter 2. Can I put it another way? Legalism says we're going to make sure that you're not free to sin. By rules and regulations, we're going to be sure you're not free to sin. License says we're free to sin. Liberty says we're free not to sin. We'd like to write that down as well. Uh, it's a bit of a neat cliche, but uh, nevertheless it's true. Legalism says you're not free to sin. We're going to make sure you're not. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. License says I'm free to sin because I'm saved by faith alone. But liberty says, I'm free not to sin. Now that's a very fine distinction, but it is the most important thing in the Christian life to get a clear grasp of the differences between those three statements. Because it's the heart of the Gospel. And we need both Paul and James to get this right. Now in chapter 2, the specific passage we're trying to unravel, it is rather misleading that the word works does have several different meanings, just as the word law has. Paul uses the word law in five different ways, but the word works is used in a number of different ways. When Paul says works, he means works of the law. But when James talks about works, he doesn't mean that. And he says, for example, I think it's better translated, as the NIV does, with the word actions. And what James is saying is faith without actions is dead. Not faith without works of the law. And he uses an illustration that love without actions is no use. 
If I say to a brother, oh my, you don't have any clothes, no food, do you? Well, God bless you, brother, God bless you. What use is that, says James? That's love without action. It's love without the works of love. When he comes to faith, he's talking about faith without action. And unless you act in faith, you don't have faith. Professing faith can't save. He says, even the devils believe that God is one, and they join the Quakers. They tremble. They do something about it. But then he gives an illustration of faith with action, and he illustrates it with Abraham and Rahab, a good man and a bad woman, but they both acted in faith. Abraham, when he nearly killed his son, his only hope of progeny, his only hope of descendants, and he was ready to kill him. That showed faith. He was prepared to risk everything. He showed his faith by his action. And Rahab the prostitute, exactly the same. Doesn't matter whether you're a good man or a bad man. Faith is acting, taking a risk. And uh, we used to play a game called faith with our three children. We used to stand about three, five steps up the staircase. And I would stand at the bottom like this. And they would say, if we jump, will you catch us? And I would say, I might. And they would stand there swaying like this, you see, with their tummies turning upside down. Then one would jump and I'd catch them, and then the other would jump and I'd catch them. They loved this game called faith. We taught them, you don't really believe in someone until you jump and take a risk. Faith without action, not real faith. Now, we don't play the game now. <laughs> For health reasons. My health. <laughs> But you see, they, they didn't believe until they acted. So that's what James is saying. Faith is not something you profess. You've got to show Jesus you believe in him by acting, by jumping, by taking the risk. You'll fall flat on your face if he doesn't catch you. That's faith. And he's absolutely right when he says, faith without actions cannot save you. It's as dead as a corpse. Faith is not reciting the creed. It's acting in faith. Put it this way, faith is not accepting the truth of God's Word. Faith is acting on the truth of God's Word. Now, too many Christians accept the truth, but don't act on it. When did you last believe in Jesus? When did you last act in a way that was taking a risk, that you'd have fallen flat on your face if he hadn't caught you? See, that's faith. James is absolutely right. There's no contradiction between Paul and James on this issue. Paul is saying the works of the law keeping the commandments won't save you. Only faith will save you. But James is saying it's got to be a faith that acts, not a faith that's said or professed, but acted upon. And so I don't see any disharmony here, and I think Martin Luther was too full of justification by faith alone to see how important James' emphasis really was, that faith must act and be worked out. What God has worked in has to be worked out in the world, in an alien atmosphere where the strangers and the aliens, the dispersion, out there, untainted by the world and living in the wisdom that comes from above that is pure and peaceable. Amen.